27. We're later than usual, so I'm sorry. We're later than I promised, but we'll just go ahead. The, um, so we're ready to start, Justin. We're rolling. Um, we are in the uh, Marrero apartment of Jean Berg, uh, who was one of the most visible and, and uh, constructive journalists in New Orleans in recent decades, uh, first as a reporter and columnist, uh, largely in politics, uh, at the State's Item and, and other papers, later as an editor at the State's Item and the Times-Picayune. Uh, I can testify to that since uh, he edited some of my stuff, uh, made it better, and, uh, and then became uh, probably the most influential of the uh, New Orleans uh, food critics in the last several decades as the, uh, the food columnist for the Times-Picayune. Um, I'm Jack Davis. Uh, this is another of our interviews for the, uh, the Oral History Project at Loyola, Making Modern New Orleans. Uh, we're talking about the 1970s, and uh, uh, Gene, uh, I'm here with uh, Justin Nystrom, uh, Assistant Professor of History at Loyola, and it's uh, May 13th, 2014. And so we're talking about the 1970s. Uh, and Gene, you, after some years uh, doing other journalistic jobs, in the summer of 1969, when things were just about to start happening politically and in other ways, you, were, you joined the staff of the state's item. Uh, what was going on then? Well, it was the year of the 1969-70 uh, mayoral race, and uh, I was assigned, fairly early, I was assigned to cover exclusively the mayor's race. I didn't have any other assignments from the time of the first Democratic primary on through the general election, which posed the Democratic versus the Republican candidate. Uh, that was in March or April of 1970. And um, it was one of the most exciting and satisfying experiences of my journalism career because I got to know politics inside out. I did a series of articles on the emergence of the black political organizations like Soul and Coup. Uh, Southern Organization for Unified Leadership and a community organization for urban politics, and there were several of us. And, and did you do that series before the election? Yes. Yeah. Uh, one thing, while I have it in mind, uh, that impressed me was with the series on black politics, uh, we ran a map, a precinct map of Arlene's Parish, and it showed by race, by racial population, or by voter registration, I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, the precinct figures. And the map showed a checkerboard, which showed that New Orleans, unlike other American cities, had really had no ghetto. Everybody lived, every white person lived not too far, except for the lakefront. I mean, the lakefront was all white. But in the central part of the city, black and white neighborhoods were not really separated that much. You could walk three blocks from an upper middle class white house and come into a, a you know, really lower middle class black neighborhood. Uh, and the so I think this was why there was never the kind of violence or unrest that appeared in places like Watts and, um, uh, I mean, Harlem was, in, in Manhattan, I mean, Harlem is, was the, it wasn't a ghetto. I mean, it was a pretty, you know, I would think, a pretty fairly prosperous neighborhood. But um, anyway. That, I think that played a part in the mayoral election, the, the fact that... Uh, well, how did it pay, play a part in the mayoral election? As, well... As this was the first... This was the first time. Soul and Coup and a few other... The Bold was another one, black organization for uh, 
leadership something development. Le leadership development, right. precisely. Jim Singleton. Uh, th th those were the first organizations that really had an effect. Uh, they were m most, if not all, were based in the Seventh Ward, which was the Creole, the Black Creole Ward in the city, as you know. And um, anyway, that was part of the background of the 1969 election. And what, why did you decide? I mean, this was a, a this is a portion of the electorate, the black electorate in New Orleans had not been particularly uh, decisive in previous elections for mayor or anything else. Why did well, you Why did you all at the state's item decide to to write about that then? Well, because of the emergence of the powerful black political organizations, you could, you but. Could, you could see it coming, or was yeah. it already? Had they already ex, uh, influenced anything yet? Yeah, the inf Well, everybody told me when I started covering the mayor's race. Everybody told me that in past elections, mayoral elections, and I would assume other municipal elections, uh, the black population was bought out by the white candidates. Uh, and uh, the 1969 election may be the first one where it didn't work. Jimmy, from what I was told, Jimmy Fitzmaurice paid off all the neighborhood ward leaders and neighborhood leaders or whatever. Jimmy uh, Fitzmaurice, who was a leading I, well, candidate in this election. I'm sorry? Jimmy Fitzmaurice, who was a leading candidate in oh, this Oh, he was number two, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, in, in the 1969 primaries, the blacks took all the money from Jimmy Fitzmaurice and voted for Moon Landry. This is what I was told and which I thought was fairly obvious because of some of the precincts that went for Landry. And did you write the series? I have to go, go back and look this up. But was, did the series come out before the first primary, or did I don't remember, Jack. Yeah. Uh, it was. It was. Uh, it was a fairly simple thing. The first, the first article in the series was on the on the front page. I remember that. I'm sure you'll find them in the Clippings yeah. Library. Do you have access to the Clippings yeah. Library? Yeah. You'll find them in the Clippings li a Library. Um, but um, but I, for, I forget exactly yeah. when it when ran. When you entered, I mean, in, in the summer of 1969, yeah. the, the, the state's item was given its editorial independence yes. from the Times Picayune. Yes. Uh, and it was free to go out and cover things as the editors, Walter Cowan and Charlie Ferguson, saw fit. Right. They, they drafted you for this critical position uh, of covering politics and the, and the mayor's race. Yeah. Uh, why did they, what, what, what was it about your background that made them think that you would be good for that? I honestly don't know. Uh, I had been working at Tulane for a couple of years in the development office and uh, I had left the Times-Picayune city desk. Uh, for complicated reasons. And then I got a phone call from somebody who told me you should you should try to call Walter Cowan, the editor of the State's Item, because George Healy is no longer in control of the State's Item. And uh, I think Charlie Ferguson was editor of the editorial page. Right. Yes, he was editor, editor of the editorial page at that time. So, uh, I had done pretty well as a general assignment reporter at the Picayune, and uh, so they knew my experience. Uh, I have to assume that's why yeah. they assigned me to the mayor's race. Well, so this was the pre was the most visible beat on a, a, yeah. a newspaper that was newly in the spotlight for being on its own. When when did you start uh, thinking that Moon Landrieu was a contender in this election? Well, I didn't know Moon Landry from Adam, except that he was a councilman at large. Uh, and the, my first 
uh, encounter with Moon Landrieu was for another series I wrote I don't, several months or whatever before the first primary, a series called The Candidates Themselves. And I interviewed all, I think there were six or eight, including several fascinating crackpots. Um, and uh, wh when I researched Moon, I discovered that he had been the lone voice during, it, when he was in the legislature, he had been the lone voice to vote against some of the, some of the se segregation laws that were being passed. And I'll never forget the lead that I used on uh, my story on Landry as a candidate. It said, in effect, that after Moon Landry voted for these, voted against these laws, he was staring into his political grave because I think, it, you, know, you know, everybody thinking he would never get reelected, but he did get reelected. And so 10 years after that, or nine years, he's running for mayor. Did you, who did you, did you think he had the capability of winning that? Uh, or? Well, the more I got into covering the race, yeah. I think it was obvious from the beginning that he and Jimmy Fitzmaurice were the two most prominent candidates. They're, 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 they were Landrew Fitzmaurice, William Gust, who, uh, whose father was attorney for the New Orleans Public Housing Authority, uh, and who I think took over from his father. It was Lloyd Rittner, who was president of the school board. Um, do you have all these people? Yeah, yeah. I think okay. We, who were the crackpots you were uh, thinking I'm of? I'm sorry? Who were the crackpots you were thinking of? Uh, one was Cecilia Pizzo, who was uh, really, she had a mental problem. Her father had been a, she, she was a very, she was a lovely lady. Uh, her father had been a shoemaker, and it was her theory that your brain power was controlled by the tightness of your shoes. Uh, then there was um, Dan Dial, who rode his bike all around the French Quarter and said that uh, he knew what the city's problems were because he had contact with these people. Uh, another one was Rodney Fertel. Uh, you know, his son wrote it, a book about him, who, whose promise, his only promise was that he would bring a gorilla to the New Orleans Zoo. He was obsessed with gorillas. And then there was a taxi driver, whose name I forget, who was an ardent segregationist and who claimed that he had created a substance that, if it was added to milk, would never curdle the milk or make it solid, even in the sunlight. <laughs> Those were. And, the, and you wrote profiles of all of them? I wrote profiles on all of them. I'll go back and reread. It was, it was really one of the most interesting series I've ever done. I mean, it was really something. <laughs> but, but Landrew prevailed. In, in, he, he got into the uh, second primary. He, right. he and Jimmy Fitzmaurice were, right. well, were the two top vote getters in the first primary, right. and then they ran a runoff election right. between the, for Democrats. Right. W were you were you there in that um, election night uh, scene with, with the, the night of the second primary? Yeah. Uh, Landrew had his ha, Landrew had his uh, election night headquarters in the Jung the old Jung Hotel on Canal Street, and um, I'm sorry. It wasn't on Canal Street. It was somewhere else. I, well, maybe no, it was. You're, I think I believe you're right, but it's not not there now. Uh, and I was Landrew asked me to go up to his room to watch the election returns, which I did. And so when the when he was announced the winner, all of us got into elevators 
and went down to the Grand Ballroom where the big party was being held. And I'll never forget this because it was one of the most emotional scenes I've ever seen, uh, th that I ever saw in covering politics. We approached the doors to the ballroom and the doors opened and I was standing right, well not right next, but next to Andrew. And when the doors opened and he appeared, this huge roar went up from the crowd in the ballroom. And Landry was just, it's like a wind had hit him. I mean, he just pulled back and there were hundreds of black hands reaching up and cheering. And it, it was really something. <laughs> In a nutshell, I mean, it, it depicted what he had done. Uh, it, it was, as I say, very emotional. And then, then we had a, a rare runoff, I mean, a rare general election right. contest. In January, in, a, in the spring I think, of 70. Right, March or April of uh, 1970, against Ben C. Toledano, who was the Republican candidate. Uh, and uh, Toledano got 40% in the, in the general election and was bragging about it because he was the first Republican who had ever gotten a significant vote in Louisiana anywhere up to that time. Uh, Toledano if my memory serves me right, Taladano did not conduct what I would call an intense campaign because there were just not that many Republicans in New Orleans. Uh, and uh, I'll never forget one thing. <laughs> ben C. was something of an aristocrat. <laughs> and he once told me, we can't have Moon Landrew as mayor of New Orleans. Verna Landrieu would be first lady. And he was, he really looked down on a wife, on Moon Landrieu's wife, for some reason, I don't know. What was the reason? But I have no idea. I didn't ask him. I, I just assumed it was because he thought she wasn't proper enough to be the first lady of New Orleans. Did it have anything to do with her uh, Italian background? Did he think? Uh, I would assume so. Well, we she, 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 she came from a successful family. She was not just part of the New Orleans establ social establishment. Um, you know, she was a very bright, charming lady, I think. Uh, but I can't recall very much about Ben C's campaign because there wasn't that much going on. I mean, you know, there did, were. Yeah, did the fact that they, they had to run the general election have any did it slow down uh, the Landrieu administration from getting started? Uh, instead of uh, preparing a transi transition after the, uh, the runoff, the, the Democratic runoff, he had That's a good run. question. I'm not sure I know the answer. Um, things, well, one other thing I remember about the, first, the, uh, the second primary was the morning after, um, I called Moon Landrieu and uh, asked him if I could go to City Hall and interview him and also to shoot a picture of his family. So uh, I went to his house and we shot a picture of his family and then he said, why don't you ride up to, the, to City Hall with me? And I said, okay, fine. So we went to City Hall and we walked into the lobby and here was Jimmy Kamilski who was in his 60s, I think more like his 70s, who had been the power in uh, the center of New Orleans, the political power in the center of New Orleans, and who had violently opposed Landrieu uh, and had worked for Jimmy Fitzmaurice. So here are these two Dominate, dominating figures in the city's political factions. And, Mr. Kamis and Jim Kaminsky said, congratulations, Mr. Mayor, and Landry went up and they talked for a couple of minutes and it was something remarkable to see. 
uh, the change, the, you know, personal, pers uh, in, in personal terms, to see the change of, that had happened, a sea change. Yeah. It was a sea change. So do you, you think um, Landrieu won in spite of the traditional uh, white political powers, the regular democratic yeah. organization? Yeah. And, and he didn't he didn't reestablish his own organization the way his predecessors no. had. No. Uh, this was the first election where uh, public relations uh, um, consultants were involved. Landrew got a man from Washington, Dan. McClung. McClung, uh, who really put it together for him. Uh, and uh, Jimmy Fitzmaurice's uh, con cons he con his consultant, the consultant he hired was Henry. He was a, a long-time political consult consultant who was extremely capable, um, but I think, Mc I, who can say whether McClung was better than, I can't think of his name, uh, but it had a lot to do with Landry's uh, election, I think. I mean, you know, they, the colors they chose. Uh, the advertising they used, uh, it was it was revolutionary for New Orleans. And you covered, did, did you start covering City city Hall then as a... Yes, the, the, yes. The, the I, had, I had a column called City Hall Report, yeah. which, I, uh, which I had for three or four years. And what did you, what was it like then in City Hall right after the election? It was the most. It was even more exciting than the campaign, I guess. Um, In what way? Well, Nixon was president, and he had uh, gotten past Congress the Model Cities program, which, as you know, uh, was a very large program to help improve the urban character of the country. And Landrieu used the Model Cities program to bring into City Hall people like Sherman Copeland, um, uh, the names don't all come to mind right away, but the Model, the Model Cities program was the generator of a great deal more of political black power. Um, um, also, Landrieu was introducing legislation that had been the kind of legislation that had been unheard of before. Uh, I think he dragged New Orleans kicking and screaming into the 20th century, was the way to, I, I see it. That may be a bit exaggerated, was but I think. Mostly, uh, how much of that was uh, uh, organized around integration? of the city's uh, politics and business? Well, that was a major part of it, but uh, one example that sticks in my mind was this. He wanted to develop the tourism industry. Uh, tourism was not a big deal until the 1970s, and I think Landry could see it coming. And one of the things he wanted to do was to on a, to come down to a very small instance, was to increase the amount that vendors paid the city to operate in the French market, to get their licenses or permits or whatever they were. And they were pittances when Landry got into office. So, the people at Café du Monde agreed to pay more. The people at Morning Call moved to Metairie. 
Mon and Carl has lost tens of millions of dollars because they would not pay a nominal, I think it was like a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year, where, where they were paying maybe a thousand dollars a month before or something. I, I don't know what the figures are. But that was the kind of thing in microcosm that he was trying to do. And um, he got a lot of resistance from it. Uh, he, he was, you know, he wanted the, he wanted the Superdome. Uh, um, and all the projects don't come to mind. Well, he wanted to develop Armstrong Park, which didn't turn out well. Um, and uh, I forget all the, uh, you, you would actually know more about these details than I do, but anyway. In, uh, well, I, I got there a couple of years after you were already writing all this. Yeah. Uh, in, in, let's talk about just integration for one thing. In the Model Cities program gave him the opportunity to hire more people Right. Using these federal funds, and he was able to. What, uh, aside from the fact that this, you know, he was able to find talent, whether it was African, he was able to find talent, whether it was black or white or whatever. Yes. Yes. Uh, he didn't. He. My impression. I mean, I walked into City Hall for the first time in 1972, mm -hmm. and I was impressed with uh, that this was a, a group of bright in the mayor's office. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, but you saw, was that the, the same as before, or did he change it? Together? Oh, he changed it drastically. I mean, his, he hired people like Mary Servagon, and uh, um, I can't think of all the names like uh, right now, Gagliano. Uh, and there was this think tank of young, uh, uh, intellectually aggressive people, young people, who would just there to come up with ideas and make recommendations to him. They produced all kinds, I mean, just all sorts of new ideas for him. Um, and one thing before I forget, when Landry was a councilman at large, he was the only one who, outside his office door in City Hall, had a line of black people coming in to see him for help. These were the only, he was the only man who ever, ever helped black people in City Hall. In his role as uh, In his role as councilman at large. And I think it's something that came f both from within as well as from his political instincts. Uh, but anyway, uh, no, he had this think tank, and uh, they would come up with ideas. He appointed a bright young person as chairman of the, or, or a director of the Vicaray Commission, which regulates, regulated all the architectural changes in the Vicaray. Um, that was Wayne Collier? Yes, it was Wayne Collier. And then Linda Friedman? L Linda Friedman. Now, Linda was one of the city hall think tank people along with uh, the guy with the curly hair whose name I can't remember right now. Larry, Larry. Coleman? Larry Coleman. Uh, Coleman. Yeah. <clears throat> and there was another one who, whose name I forget. But no, what city, the mayor's office, City Hall, was throbbing with energy. I mean, it was like a revolution had occurred. Vic Skiro, the previous mayor. Had been a charlatan. Uh, you know, he was a Comiskey creation, more or less. And uh, there was a TV reporter named Bob Krieger who wrote an article for New Orleans Magazine uh, called the, Cha Ch the Sayings of Chairman Vic with all of these quotes like uh, uh, during, uh, right at, in the aftermath of a hurricane, he got on TV and said, do not believe in any false rumors unless they come from City Hall. And at a banquet with John McKithen there, he said, look at that lovely Mrs. McKithen, every wrinkle in her face is glowing. And uh, these just went on and on. I mean, but they were a window into his personality. 
and, so he, and his intellect. And, and Mayor Skiro hadn't recruited the same kind of talent. I'm sorry? Mayor Skiro didn't attract the same talented. Uh, oh, of workers. course not, no. Uh, I, I once walked in on Skiro. This was when I was general assignment reporter for the Picayune. I walked in to Skiro's office, and there was a TV reporter there, I forget who. And the TV reporter was harassing the mayor and insulting him and everything else, and Skiro just sort of stood there. It was, it was extraordinary. Well, what was it about Moon Landrieu that attracted these bright people to City Hall? Did it, or was it, a, was it the promise that New Orleans was showing at the time? Oh, it was definitely that. I mean, they recognized him uh, from the very beginning when they, when they got with him. I'm sure it was clear to them that they were going to have a serious responsibility and that they were going to have to produce. Uh, there was a communication there that was, you know, perfect. And, and were, as reporter, did you have access to those people? At yes, oh, level? definitely. Oh, yes. They were open? I got to know them well. Yeah. Regularly, regularly uh, counted on them for reports of what was going on at City Hall, because I couldn't, couldn't be in the mayor's office every day. I mean, I, I used to spend every day at City Hall. Uh, th there was a, a press room there. And uh, I, I just, I wrote there, I uh, did, oh, of course, all my interviews there, made phone calls, whatever. And what were they, what, what do you remember them being most energized about? Was it the, having the chance to remake the city physically or to remake uh, the, the, the politics that had suppressed black influence for so long? Or? You mean at City Hall? Or yeah, the city? What, was, what was their main thrust that you recall from those days? They were going in so many directions. It, it, it was, it's really, uh, I remember <laughs> sitting in Dan McClung's office. Dan McClung became an assistant. He went from this consulting work to being one of Moon Landry's executive assistants, and I would, I would ch go into Dan's office every morning and check with him and what was going on. And one morning I uh, was interviewing him, and there was this black, young black person, man, sitting in a, a chair off to the side. And uh, he was being groomed. And Dan said, I want to introduce you to Sidney Bartholomew. Well, Sidney Bartholomew was head of the uh, health, health department or something at that, or he was working in one of the city departments, I forget which. But that was a common site where you would go in and, you know, there'd be a black person in charge, which Pete, was. Pete Sanchez was the. Pardon? Pete Sanchez was yes. the department, I think the first head of a major department. I think you're right. And, uh, San, yeah, the sanitation department. You're right, yes, I remember. And then uh, Bartholomew was uh, within a, you know, another few mayor terms was to become mayor himself. Yeah. Do you think, you think that was the, a, a main learning experience for him? Uh, oh, no, without question, you know. I don't think he became a very good mayor, but um, yeah, he uh, of course he eventually became a councilman and then and then ran, and ran for mayor. How much time were they spending on the Superdome? Uh, was that a city hall? Was it was it commanding attention in city hall, or was that the, the independent Superdome commission? I think the. the the soup gnome doesn't stick in my mind for some reason. I think it may have been, when, what, what was the year the Superdome was done, 1974, 75? I think it opened in 1975. Well, if it opened in 1975, it was, then it was definitely going on there, but 
I think the Superdome was a whole different part of coverage. Uh, once it became a fait accompli, City Hall was not really that active in, in, in discussing it because it was there. Um, Moonlander had played a part in getting the Superdome built and then oh, located downtown. Did, were they, did they spend much time uh, taking advantage of the Superdome's location to develop the downtown? all of the Poydra Street uh, developments that took place in the 1970s. Did that well, show one up thing, on city, city Hall agendas? The only thing I remember about that, at least right away, is that Landrieu had proposed an increase in the property tax millage for downtown businesses. And he called a press conference to announce it. And with businessmen there, uh, it, wa it wasn't so much a press conference as it was a meeting with the businessmen in the C CBD. And, uh, but it was a lot of people there. And when Landry explained his proposal, he got an enthusiastic applause from all the businessmen. Well, <laughs> Lola Eli was there. And I saw Lola and I said, what do you think, Lois? Isn't this exciting? He said, "Man, this is BS." They're all applauding him, but they're not—they're not, they're not going to come across with the money. And sure enough, he was right. And how did they avoid coming up with the money? Pardon? After, how did they avoid com coming up with the money after that enthusiastic? Uh, well, I don't remember the details, but I propose—I assume it was proposed and it was voted down because of their opposition. Were they, um, it, it, was it evident in the beginning of the Landry administration that the New Orleans economy in, was, was looking pretty bright? I mean, the 1970s, as it turned out, uh, was a boom time in, uh, especially in oil, to a certain extent yes. in port, and, and as you said, the start of a more active tourist industry. Did they see this coming, and did that, did that, raise the spirits in City Hall? I, I would think so. I think they had to get a sense of satisfaction from some of the things that they were accomplishing, plus um, with these, these outside influences that improve the economy. Um, it was the best of both worlds. I mean, so uh, it was all very positive around that time. Yeah. Um, so the so the energy level was was good. Um, how long did you cover City Hall? You said two, three or four years. Four years, uh, and then I became a, then I became an editorial writer. Uh, I'm trying to remember what, uh, what what was going on in that last year. One thing I remember while I was covering City Hall was this. Moon Landry appointed Clay Shaw head of the French Market Corporation. This was after Garrison's trial, charging him with the uh, a plot to assassinate J John Kennedy. For, I'll never forget seeing Clay Shaw at this press conference that was called to announce his appointment. I mean, he was a new man. And um, it was a guy who died a couple of three years later, I think. But uh, he was kind of a symbol of what Landrieu knew that he was a man who was head of the International Trademark, one of the most, was one of the most influential businessmen in New Orleans. And he had been treated like dirt. In the prosecution by Garrison. Right. So, uh, you know, it was just one of the 
a mosaic of things that Landry did that added up to a tremendous sense of accomplishment and progress in the city. Yeah. Was, what, how did New Orleans um, politicians deal with the Clay Shaw prosecution and Jim Garrison's, uh, uh, as it turns out, crazy case? How did, what, did that show up in the mayor's race in 1970? No. Uh, were, no. were people embarrassed by the Shaw prosecution? It wasn't an issue in the mayor's race, you know. I, as, yeah. At least I can't remember that it was. It, if it, uh, if it was, it was a minor issue, I would think. And what was what was um, Moonlander's motivation in appointing Clay Shaw to the French Market Corporation head? He never told me, but I would assume it was because of his experience as. Director, as you know, director of the International Trade Mart, uh, and maybe only peripherally because of the Garrison prosecution. Um, Was it a chance for redemption? I mean, a chance for oh, definitely. To oh yes, oh yes. Into the spotlight. I mean, that was the whole thrust of the column I wrote after that press conference. That here was the reemergence of a major. New Orleans figure after a, a ludicrous criminal prosecution. I think you, you once told me about an incident involving Clay Shaw and Jim Garrison in one of Ella Brennan's restaurants. Yes. And Is that Ella Brennan, remind me about that? Ella Brennan, this was at Brennan's restaurant on Royal Street. Uh, in sometime in the 1960s, I guess, uh, she was in a dining room at Brennan's restaurant, and Jim Garrison was having lunch with his wife, and Clay Shaw was also in the dining room. Whether he was with Ella Brennan or not, I don't, I don't know. But Jim Garrison began berating his wife audibly in the dining room, and uh, it was causing, you know, some disturbance. And supposedly Clay Shaw went, uh, I'll say supposedly, if Ella Brennan says it's true, it's true. Clay Shaw got up and went over to Garrison's table and said something to the effect that, you know, why don't you behave yourself, you're causing a disturbance here or something. And the result of that is that there was some speculation that this sparked the idea in Garrison's mind to prosecute Shaw on ridiculous evidence. And this, this incident, you know, didn't happen, it happened after the assassination of Kennedy. Right. And, did, and Garrison was DA then. Right. Uh, he was he was a very strange figure <laughs> in a lot of ways. The um, after you uh, came back as an editorial writer, um, what were you writing? What, what were the main things the stateside item was supporting at that time? Well, first of all, um, they were anti. I say they. I guess I guess you could say we were anti-Vietnam anti-Nixon. It was a liberal newspaper. Uh, and it was my understanding that the Newhouse family, which owned both the States item and the Picayune, gave the States item license to express editorial opinions completely different from the Picayunes. Uh, I've never heard of that done before in an American newspaper. And Charles Ferguson, who very capably ran that editorial department, uh, was always open to discussion among the editorial writers as to what the policy would be on any particular issue. But everybody seemed to be in agreement in most cases. Uh, I was not present 
in, in the year that the state's item endorsed McGovern against Nixon. Uh, but it was my, my, Ferguson can either affirm or deny this. It was my understanding that the strong belief by the other, other editorial writers that the state's item should not put its name on Richard Nixon's candidacy uh, was the ultimate reason the Picayune, and, I mean, the uh, state's item endorsed Nixon. In the meantime, well, also during this period, during the Nixon uh, or later, during the uh, Nixon impeachment, the state's item was running these editorials damning Nixon for all this, and the Times began was running front page editorials by the publisher defending Nixon, even at the time that the uh, Congressional Committee, Impeachment Committee members were abandoning him, the Repo Republicans on the committee were abandoning Nixon and the Times McKean was still fighting for him, which is an indication of how far apart the state's item and the Picayune were. Did you have the same chasm on, on local issues, city hall issues? Yes, oh, definitely. Yeah. What was the state's item pushing at that time? Uh, uh, editorially. Armstrong Park, for one thing, but I don't know if the picking was for or against it. Uh, it's hard to come up with specific yeah. issues after all these years. But uh, well, let me ask you. Let me ask you about at the end of the Lander years, Dutch Morio yes, becomes mayor. Yes. How did things change in in terms of uh, city government and what you were? I don't think I don't think things changed radically. Uh, I don't remember Morial as a a blazing force for change. Uh, he was not a fan of Moon Landry's politically, but uh, a brilliant man. I remember as a general assignment reporter, Nightside when Dutch Morial was uh, president of the New Orleans chapter of the NAACP. And I went to a meeting on Dryad Street, this was at night, of the, mem of the membership. And Dutch walked in and here were all of the, I call him Dutch, Morial walked in and here were all these really nice black people sort of dressed in shirts and just shirts and trousers or whatever. And here walks Dutch, here walks in Dutch Morio in his Ivy League suit and his Ivy League tie and all this. And uh, it was quite a contrast. And I, I got the impression that he was uncomfortable among all of these people because he was as white as he was black for one thing. Uh, uh, but a, a very, very intelligent and an honest person, I think. Did he, was he able to continue, if there was a trajectory in New Orleans government for uh, opening up uh, the, the, the restrictions of segregation and opening up uh, government to continuing the economic boom, was Dutch able to continue I, I, I wasn't covering things? City Hall there, so, uh, my my observations wouldn't be yeah. r really valid, but um, I thought he did a good job as mayor. His personality left him something to be desired because he had lived a hard life. He was the first black student at LSU because he passed as white. Uh, I mean, this was during segregation. And uh, he, he fought for what he got. Uh, nobody ever gave Dutch Morial anything. Oh, I, I was a friend. I, be, I was able to, after I left the paper and everything, I, I got to be a friend of Dutch and Sybil. When, when you, uh, it, during the Morial first term in, in City Hall, mm -hmm. the, the, the state's item merged with the Times-Picayune 
and you and other editors of the state's item took over the Times Picayune. Do you, mm -hmm. what were you doing in that um, merger? What was what what was your responsibility? What was I doing on the state's item? I was your assistant city editor. But what we what I'm trying to re recall uh, the, the 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 newsroom when we merged these two papers. Uh, what changed? I had left. You see, I had left. I was editor f at Figaro for about nine months. Ah, that's that's coming back to me. Yes. You, having been one of the founders of Figaro, should remember that. But anyway, I had been an editor. I had left the paper, and Ch Charlie Ferguson, in one of the kindest things I've, that's ever been done for me, took me back on the state side. Of and I became assistant, you know, assistant city editor. And then when the papers were combined, I became your, one of your assistant metro editors. And what, what did we accomplish? I, mean, I guess I should ask it that way. What, well, what I did remember. What we accomplished with the merger of uh, the, the, the two papers? As well, one thing, it, it set the picky in straight. I mean, the editor of the picky in had been a clown. I hate to say it that way, but I mean, every holiday he would come dressed up for the holiday like, St. Patrick for St. Patrick's Day and Santa Claus for Christmas and on Valentine's Day, I forget what he did. I mean, you know, the, he was unbelievable. Anyway, Ferguson took over this, the Times Picky Inn and the State Side and turned New Orleans journalism around. I see that, so if this happening at the end of the 1970s, the 1980s, yeah. was one of the, the legacies of the 1970s going forward. I mean, Ferguson opened the Picayune up in a way that Moon Landry opened City Hall up, you know, to bring in all of these young, accomplished uh, people. I mean, we could go down the list. Uh, you, Dean Bakke, who's now head of the well, no, Bakke came on the state side of him, who's now managing editor of the New York Times, Walter Isaacson, uh, all these people. Well, and uh, don't forget Laurie Hayes, who's... Uh, well, Laurie Hayes and Fen, Fen Montaigne and... Uh, countless others. Pardon? And, and countless others. Yes. But, but projecting, this was, this put the Times Picayune in position in the 80s and 90s to do good work. Yes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Picayune, I, it took a few years for it to sink in, you know, and the rest of the, the journalism community around the country, but I think the, the fruit was born by the fact that Picayune won three Pulitzer Prizes eventually under Jim Amos, who was, you know, a very competent editor. Charlie's and and Charlie laid the groundwork for that. Uh, we were we were stimulated. We were excited about getting things done. Well, this gives me a, an opportunity to transition into food. Okay. Because one of the things that the Times Picayune did so well was uh, continue the earlier states item tradition of restaurant coverage. Yes. And even though you had been covering politics and writing editorials and editing Figaro, uh, when you became the food critic of the Times Picayune in, I think, 1985. Yes. But you'd been looking, you'd been experienced food, the conspiracy, excuse me, experiencing food in New Orleans, obviously, in the 1970s and, and built that into your coverage. Right. What, take us, what was going on in, the, in food in New Orleans? in the 1970s? Um, well, I was, in the 1970s, I was simply a restaurant goer. I mean, I, I, I don't know about the frequency of it or anything, but I always paid attention to what I ate because I had spent two years in France when I was in the Army. Uh, in fact, I wrote an article for Gourmet Magazine about my years as a 24, 25-year-old 
uh, first in the southwest of France near Bordeaux and then in Paris for a year. And I learned to eat, uh, especially since everything was so cheap that, uh, you know, I, I lived in Paris as a civilian and while waiting for an apartment I was living in a hotel for two dollars a night in 1963. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, my mother was a wonderful cook and I always liked food and uh, I think I learned, when I was in France I learned how to eat, how to really eat. Um, but in the 1970s, um, Mr. B's opened, uh, which, and, and Paul Prudhomme, I don't know if he was the first chef, but he was a, a, a chef there. Uh, and of course Prudhomme was, this was before he became the number one, in terms of his recognition, the top chef in, this, in, in New Orleans and around the country. Um, what did, what, let me ask uh, Mr. Bees, what did Mr. Bees do that was different from what had been done? Well, they did Paul Brudhomme's dishes, which were quite different from what he would later do at K. Paul's Louisiana Kitchen. I think I mentioned to you once, he had one of the, which may be the best shrimp dish I've ever had in New Orleans, which he never did after he left Mr. Bees. It was uh, called Shrimp Chippewa. And it was simply a, this incredible shrimp broth with a big piece of toasted New Orleans French bread in the middle of it with these wonderfully cooked shrimp. I forget exactly how he cooked them. But, uh, but Mr. B's was to become the first restaurant to feature grilled fish. Uh, the fish, the fish were the big deal at Mr. B's eventually, uh, and it had some terrific chefs. Uh, who, and who hired Paul Prudhomme for Mr. B, Mr. B's? Probably Ella Brennan from Commanders, because uh, Prudhomme was working f at Commanders Palace around the same time. And, uh, and what did she see in him that she couldn't get in other chefs? You'd have to ask her that, but uh, she tells me, and I think I've recounted this story to you before, when Paul Prudhomme was at Commander's Palace before he opened his own place, uh, there was a, a German-born chef there, sort of classic continental chef, uh, and that was Prudhomme, uh, and Ella Brennan, the way the story goes, as she told me, uh, was talking in her office to the two of them and she just said, suppose we're out on a river bank or on, on the bank of a lake or river and we catch a fish. How would you cook it? And I, I don't know what the German guy said. But Paul Prudhomme said he would put it in a black cast iron skillet, get it red hot, cover it with spices, and char it on one side, <laughs> and char it on the other side. It became black and red fish. <laughs> and I remember when I was covering restaurants, I got Nation's Restaurant News, which is a weekly newspaper covering the industry. And I remember a headline on a story inside Nation's Restaurant News which says, we'll blacken anything, says restaurateur. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was the biggest thing in the, going on in the country in those days. It was amazing. Of course, it was all terrible, <laughs> but people were going yeah. for it. So the, the, the black and red fish took place sometime in the 1970s? In the, yeah. Uh, but but I, I don't think, well, when did Prudhomme open Louisiana Kitchen? I think 1979. Uh, after he left Ella After he left uh, Commanders, yeah. But he would had a major influence on command. Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was doing the, uh, eventually he was doing all the menus. I remember I first saw on a menu at Commanders, 
the word debris, which is means scrapings, meat scrapings, and so forth. And uh, he was he he really jazzed up that commander's menu. No, he uh, Ella Brennan gave him his start, but he ran with that ball something incredible. And what, so you as in, in the 1970s as more a consumer of food and a, yes. a discriminating eater. Right. What else was going on? The, the Richard Collins, I looked in my co copy of Richard Collins' Underground mm -hmm. Gourmet, and its copyright date is 1970. Uh -huh. uh, Collins was the first, am I correct in this, the first restaurant critic in New Orleans? Yes, without question. And can you describe the impact of that? Were people paying attention? Oh, it was, it was the hottest thing in the city. It never had, I mean, here's, per capita, the greatest restaurant interest in the country, and there was no restaurant review. Of course, restaurant review was something completely new. Craig Claiborne started it at the New York Times. But when uh, Collins' paperback restaurant guide, before he came to the state side, uh, when that restaurant guy was published, it was the hottest thing going on in the city. And uh, it's, uh, you know, I, you know, Ferguson, Charles Ferguson, the editor, admitted that, you know, he hired him because of the popularity of this book, oh, uh, although he, credit, he credits his wife, Jane, for having suggest, suggested it. The Underground Gourmet, was published by Simon & Schuster, a series of books that were published around the country, uh, and Colin wrote the one about New Orleans. Uh, but Colin was a big circulation booster for, for the state's item. He, uh, uh, especially for the Lanyap section, which is the entertainment section tabloid, section that was inserted in the paper. Uh, no, he was, he was a big deal. And what impact did he have on the kind of restaurants New Orleans had? He probably stimulated a lot of popular interest in restaurant going that, that might not have been there before. Um, I mean, it had to, it had to do, have a tremendous impact because of the interest that uh, that was in the column. Did we get a greater diversity of cuisines as part, partly as a result of that? Uh, um, was he having a wider variety of things to cover? I would think that it had some effect, although uh, the expansion of the types of restaurant cuisine uh, came after, after Colin. I mean, ethnic restaurants were very few, aside from Mexican and, and Italian and maybe one or two others, when, uh, when Colin was reviewing uh, the, uh, the new exotic culinary traditions didn't come through until I would say the early to mid '80s, uh, they started popping up more uh, in around 1985 when I started reviewing restaurants. We're, but one of the people, uh, one of the things you sent me was about the arrival of Tom Kalman uh, in 1977. Yes. To Jonathan's, to Marty's. Restaurant Jonathan, yeah. Mar no, Upper Jonathan and Upper Line. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Jonathan and Marty's, yes. And then Upper Line. Did, did, did he, what, what impact, and were there other people like him coming to town? Well, Jonathan was the chicest place in town. It was an Art Deco restaurant owned by an architect and his partner, and the architect designed the whole restaurant which was spectacular. I mean, it was, uh, 
decor was extraordinary in terms of art. It was the most beautiful art, art deco restaurant I've ever seen. I mean, I've seen pictures, nothing compared with Jonathan. Anyway, <clears throat> they were open for about six months when they needed a new chef. And um, Tom Kalman, who was originally from Columbus, Ohio, but he had restaurants in Manhattan and Long Island. Uh, or he cooked at restaurants in Manhattan and Long Island. And a, a friend of his in New Orleans convinced him to come and take the job at Jonathan. Well, in, among the in-the-know crowd, Jonathan was flying high, something incredible. And this was in 1978, 79, so forth. Uh, Kalman's repertoire was international. He had spent, he, he was a self-taught cook, but he had spent a year in France. Uh, he had made frequent trips to Mexico and the Caribbean, and uh, he had an eclectic menu, everything from Barbados rum trifle to uh, duckling with orange sauce. And then he got into the New Orleans repertoire and produced some incredible variations on traditional New Orleans dishes. But at Jonathan, his first dishes were, you know, really no, more northeastern than southern. And if you wanted to be seen with the in crowd, you went to Jonathan. That's the way it was. Well, by the time he got to Upper Line with the owner, Joanne Clevenger, he, he had adopted a lot of Local oh, yes. Stuff. Yes. I mean, he did remoulades. He did, uh, uh, they don't all come to mind right now, but uh, I was no longer reviewing restaurants at that time. And Oh, well, this was before, yeah. I, I should say, before I was reviewing restaurants. Uh, Tom and I had mutual friends in New Orleans, and he got to be one of my very best friends. And, I, you know, I. I can't be completely objective about Tom, <laughs> but. Uh, well, in this in this period of the '70s, New Orleans people got more aware of what New Orleans food had been all along, weren't they? I mean, in addition to the outside influences um, introduced by people like Tom Kalman, the Collins, Richard yeah, and Remo Collins, right, right. did a cookbook right. called the New Orleans Cookbook, in right. which they told taught people how to how to. What well, it was for? it was Rima's cookbook, yeah. really. I mean, Tom was the taster. His obituary. Was, yeah. Dick was the taster. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there is, I think, common agreement that uh, the New Orleans Creole cookbook is the best uh, in you know the last twenty-five, fifty, whatever so years. You're talking about the Collins cookbook, Rima Collins. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, Which I think was just called the New Orleans Cookbook. Pardon me? I think it was just called the Oh, New the New Orleans, Orleans Cookbook? Cookbook? I'm sorry. Well, yeah. yeah. And, the, and the Creole Cookbook was the decades, much older Times Picayune uh, title. Oh, yeah. That went back to 1901. Yeah. 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 Uh, but, the, but the Collins Cook, I remember people using the Collins Cookbook in the 1970s, religiously trying to teach themselves to appreciate New Orleans food. Oh, yeah. I can understand that. No, the Picayune, uh, the Picayune Creole Cookbook, which was the title of that first cookbook, was, I mean, it's unusable today because, of, in part because some ingredients and techniques, and I mean, it's just, it, it's, uh, it's not a usable cookbook, right. although the Picayune got Marcel Bienvenu to redo it, but I don't think that ever really took off. Um, they had her redo a lot of the recipes and everything and print it and, and uh, write it in, in a, a comprehensible style for the 20th century, late 20th century, but I don't think it ever took off. The, you know, we've been exploring the, in, in, in this and other interviews the, the um, sort of revived cultural awareness in New Orleans in this decade of the, of the 1970s. Um, 
Did you see it happening in, in uh, other areas? In, uh, I mean, the, jazz, the first jazz fest, uh, like the first underground gourmet, uh, was 1970. I don't think so. I remember going to a jazz fest performance by Carmen McRae in Municipal Auditorium in the 1960s. Yep. There, and there was also some of it on the steamer president. True. True. I but, think uh, the, the, uh, the, what we now, what now has evolved as the Jazz and Heritage Festival, uh -huh. I think its first manifestations were in in uh, Congo Square, uh, Armstrong Park now, uh, in 1970 and 71. I may be wrong about that. Before it moved to the fairgrounds. Well, it may not have been called the New Orleans yeah. Jazz and, oh, that's right, I mean, Heritage and so forth. But, and, no, and, that, and, but there was a jazz fest in New Orleans in the 1960s. Right, and then was that building the, the, the consciousness about New Orleans music? As oh, without. Well, well, question. I mean, it has become a phenomenon. I mean, when Bruce Springsteen, Bruce Springsteen comes to New Orleans and plays for four hours, this doesn't happen anywhere else in the United States, I would think. And sings, <laughs> and sings a Dr. John song. Yeah. Well, do you remember the, the world of the consciousness of music opening up uh, in the 1970s. Uh, I'm, I'm testing this idea that, you know, along with the politics well, and the food and the, and the prosperity, we had uh, people paying more attention to New Orleans music uh, and architecture and other, other manifestations of a local culture. Do you think that's um, pushing it too hard? I think that had to happen. The thing about me and New Orleans music is it goes, it starts when I was in high school and high school students' parents would give house parties and Papa Celestan would play. And, <laughs> you know, there, there was, there was no, there, were, uh, there was dance, uh, dance hall. In fact, uh, you and I remember well that dance hall in the, was it in the Ninth Ward? Uh, was that Lutjens? Lutjens, yes. Um, but, uh, well, when, when, when well, I mean, New Orleans, like everything else in New Orleans, I mean, New Orleans music progressed along with the consciousness of New Orleans music around the country, I mean, it progressed well, more and more. For you, I mean, where did you go to high school? And where, and where did Del you live? Del LaSalle. Del LaSalle. Catholic Del High School. Town. And then, and you lived, where were your, where were your house parties? Were there? You, Uptown. Yeah. And so Papa Celestin and, and sort of traditional New Orleans jazz was already in your head. Yeah. But there are all these new people uh, Am I, am I wrong in this? New people discovering it in the uh, in later years. Not so much in New Orleans. Well, you mean New Orleanians? Well, people outside New Orleans too. Yeah. Um, well, no. When when Preservation Hall opened, that you you know more than I do when that was. But, Early 1960s. Yeah. When Preservation Hall opened. It became a major tourist attraction not long after, and uh, needless to say, that did a lot to, to yeah. promote the jazz culture here. When you were uh, growing up and, and, uh, and going to high school, were, was there as much consciousness about was there as much consciousness about New Orleans having a distinct culture, food, music, architecture? As they're, as they're developed later? I think it was more infused in everybody locally, but it wasn't that well known around the country. I mean, Jackson Square was, was empty. Uh, you know, there wasn't anybody there until the tourism boom started. As for the music, I will never forget this. When I was a junior at De La Salle in uh, 
1957, no, wait a minute, I started, 1958. Everybody was talking about this new rock, and, a, a rock and roll record called Hearts of Stone. And nobody ever talked about jazz. I mean, you know, it was just not what you listen to. You listen to pop music. And I'll never forget, that was the first rock and roll song I ever heard of. <laughs> Hearts of Stone by, I can't remember who. Was, but, it, was it a New Orleans record? No, it's no. The national culture. There was a lot of New Orleans uh, rock and roll, of course. Uh, the uh, uh, the people who have the grocery store in St. Philip and Dumain and the Quarter, whatever. Uh, Cosmo Matassa was recording all this stuff here in New Orleans, all this rhythm and blues, uh, and which then, developed into rock and roll. So you had the Ernie Cato uh, records and Lee Dorsey and um, other other groups. But they, they had kind of faded from consciousness by the time yeah. the 70s rolled around. And then they, as I recall, in the 70s, partly as a result of Jazz Fest, uh, partly as a result of Quint Davis and Allison Minor mm -hmm. bringing people like Professor Longhair back, right. uh, it had a revival. That I remember the first Jazz Fest I went to at the fairgrounds, there was a a black singer, piano player, a man, playing some terrific music. And there were like five people standing in front of him, <laughs> listening to him. That was the first jazz fest of the fairgrounds. It, I mean, it just, yeah. it grew like, like a tornado. I mean, it was just yeah. unreal. But yeah. one, one thing I, I, I wanted to mention also, uh, when rock, when I, when I started hearing a lot of rock and roll, it was not known as rock and roll. I, and I, I think the term rock and roll came from a song by a rhythm and blues artist who, his name I don't remember, but he sang a song called The 60 Minute Man. And the lyrics, some of the lyrics were, now if your man don't treat you right, come up and see old Dan. He'll rock 'em, roll 'em all night long. That's the 60-minute man. <laughs> and, uh, I've this, never forgotten and, uh, was that. Was this a New Orleans lyric? Uh, I don't know if he was New Orleans or not, uh, but it was something else. Anyway, we're getting off track. No, but when you when you went to Jazz Fest in probably 1972, and there, it, you know, that could have been. Is that the first one at the fairgrounds? Yeah, yeah. That's when I went. I mean, it could have been James Booker. Oh, who, yeah. Who well, did, well did, I'm sure. I can't remember all. In subsequent all. years, would have had a crowd of tens of thousands. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember all the, uh, all the artists. But, uh, right. let, me, let me turn to Justin to see uh, yeah, additional questions. Do you want to take pause. a pause? Yeah, pause, please. Yeah. I see the red light. Here. We're good. So you, you grew up on the West Bank. Right? Yeah. Okay, so you're pretty familiar with life out here. Uh, I moved. I moved into the city when I was nineteen, okay. and but I went and I went to high school in the city. But you, you would occasionally visit the West Bank over your time in New Orleans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the thing is, when I was thirteen, I started at De La Salle, and I more or less abandoned the West Bank at the age of thirteen because right. all my friends and everything were in the city, mm -hmm. uh, and then I went to Tulane. And at 19, I had my own apartment. Right. I got my first job at the Picayune uh, in the library of all places. I was interviewed by the editor, George Healy, and he said, how fast can you type? And I said, 60, minutes a wor 60 words a minute, Mr. Healy. And he said, well, go down to personnel and talk to Mrs. Nichel. <laughs> That's how I got in the newspaper business. <laughs> And then I became assistant financial editor and then uh, went in the Army and came back and became a reporter. Anyway, that's another story. So uh, you want to talk about the West Bank? A little bit, and then specifically in the context of restaurants, um, the 
Underground Gourmet always put the Le, Le Roots restaurant oh, yeah. as one of the top restaurants oh, in the was. city. Oh, it was. Oh, yeah, it was. Uh, well, what, what made it such a great restaurant? Uh, Warren LaRuth used to go to France, uh, and he developed a lot of French techniques, and he sort of creolized a few of them. Uh, I don't think his food was as good, I don't think it would have flown as high in France as it did in New Orleans, but he created some especially seafood dishes. Uh, and there were a lot of really good restaurants on the West Bank in those days because the oil industry was doing really well and you had a lot of business people going to lunch and dinner there and everything. And when the oil business collapsed, everything, you had, uh, you had steakhouses, you had a German restaurant, you had La Ruth's, you had, I, mean, I don't know, I can't remember them all, but you had maybe eight or ten really top-rate restaurants. Oh, th there was a, fr a real French place uh, on the West Bank run by a native Frenchman, who I can't remember his name or the name of the place, but uh, that was the only period that I know of that uh, w where there were some decent restaurants on the West Bank. Uh, I'm talking the six. This I'm talking maybe the seventies because there was Willie Cohn's Chalet, which I reviewed when uh, and had been a long-established restaurant. La Roots, which had been a long established, when I was reviewing in the 80s, La Roots had been long well established. Um, Del Frisco's Steakhouse, which was, some people said, better than Ruth's Chris, and they opened in Dallas and made a fortune. Um, and you had, there's some, there were some Italian places, Bertuzzi's, B-E-R-T-U-C-C-I. Have you heard of the Bertuzzi's? They had a wonderful restaurant on Fourth Street in Harvey, right next to the, well, right near the bridge, the Harvey Canal Bridge. It was terrific. And they, there was a, there's a strong Sicilian population on the West Bank, as you know, I'm sure. Uh, and the Bertuzzi's, had a wonderful restaurant. They established, established it in the early 19, I think early to mid 1920s. When did, when did, uh, when did things really just start shrinking on the West Bank? When did, when did the, when did the optimism fade from the oil? With the oil, the oil, the oil so, bust. What, do you remember what year La Roots went out? I wish I could. It, I think it was in, it was in the 80s. Uh, I'm trying to think of who you, who could talk to you more about this. Uh, I know Tom Fitzmaurice had written. Oh, you know who might, who might want to talk to is uh, Marcel Bienvenu, because she had a restaurant which was thriving, and when the oil, oil I have her phone number and uh, email if you want them. Uh, she had a restaurant called Chez Marcel, but in Cajun country. And she said, I can tell you the, uh, the day and the hour that the oil bust occurred because my customers stopped coming in. You want her phone number? And uh, we can do that. Yeah, yeah. Post yeah. Uh, that, we'll get it. We'll, we'll get that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but my, my dad had a lumber business in Harvey, not uh, just a few hundred or maybe a an eighth of a mile from the Harvey Canal. And uh, there was a lot of activity uh, around the canal then, but I don't remember, I, you know, in the 80s, I, I, I never came to the West Bank. <laughs> so I really didn't know what happened uh, at that point. But um, 
there were some good restaurants here. It's, there's nothing left, absolutely nothing. You, have you read Tom Fitzmorris's book, that Hungry Town book uh, he had written? Uh, came out a couple I'm sorry, years. I'm my Tom ear. Fitzmorris's book, that Hungry Town book that he came out with about two or three years ago. Have you, have you seen no. that? No. One of the things he mentions in that book is um, how Mr. B's represented something different and Kate Paul's represented something different and sort of a, a way of dining. Not just, but, but they were casual restaurants. And of course, this is going on other parts of the country. Do you see it that way? No. I have no respect for Tom Fitzmaurice. I mean, I'll be perfectly frank with you. He lies. He lies even when he doesn't have to lie. <laughs> I remember once. <laughs> I, I haven't heard his show in years, but I was listening. To, I was listening to this program, and somebody called up and said, uh, "Oh, I read somewhere about a French dessert, uh, about a dessert called clafouti, C L A F O U T I." He says, "Oh, clafouti, that was popular outside of London in England. Clafouti is a French dessert from the southwest of France, but he just makes this stuff up." I would never rely on that guy for a historical fact in a million years. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe re more recently. I mean, he's prolific, you know. I mean, he, he rated restaurants that he never visited. Uh, the people who opened uh, the Chicory Farm Cafe in uh, Carrollton, they had never, he had never mentioned the restaurant on the program, and uh, they bought some advertising, and so he put them in his letter and gave them, f I don't know, four stars or something, and they ought to still me, God, never set foot in this place. <laughs> Where does he get the money? He claims he pays for every single meal he gets. That's that's fifteen, twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars a year we're talking about. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. No. Um, I, I I was wondering what did what did the old established restaurants? Did you ever hear any resistance to the sort of new Paul Prudhomme paradigm that emerged with black in and the red Cajun fish? category? Well, I'm you thinking you know somebody like. I mean, everybody kind of would say Antoine's is being, or Broussard's, or La Louisiane. What was their reaction? Did they, I mean, was there any resistance to this style of, of, of cooking? A lot of people. I remember before K. Paul's became famous, I, I lived in a quarter. I used to go there. And it was, you know, you'd walk in and you'd sit down and eat, and it was cheap, cheap as dirt. Uh, I got some of the grittiest potatoes I've ever had in my life when I ate there once, but that's all right. Uh, uh, repeat the question. I'm sorry. Did, did any of the sort of grand dame restaurants yeah. kind of resent this new style of cooking? I think they resented the fact that he was making a lot of money. Uh, I don't think, I mean, there was nothing they could do about his popularity. Uh, a lot of you know, there's a streak in New Orleans where people uh, resent success. Smart asses who make a lot of money, you know, you're doing something. Uh, and I think there was a certain amount of that for Paul Prudhomme because he, uh, he came from nowhere and he's a Cajun and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but there's no question that he changed New Orleans cooking. I mean, Frank Wrightson is a variation on a Paul Prudhomme thing. Uh, he's one of the most brilliant chefs in the city. Uh, his Oysters Rockefeller soup is a hell of a lot better than Oysters Rockefeller. <laughs> so, there was definitely, there still is definitely, a strong Prudhomme streak 
in certain ways in New Orleans, I think, in New Orleans. But, you know. Do you think Paul Prudhomme has a sense of how influential he was? Uh, I, I talked to him maybe three or four times. He just impressed me as a, a, a sort of unprepossessing a Cajun boy. I mean, he, he never really pushed himself on people or anything uh, that I know of. Uh, He's a, very, he's a very simple person. You're Not like Emeril. <laughs> like Bam. Yeah. Well, Emeril followed Prudhomme yeah. as commanders. Right. What was the difference in the effect? It was sensational. Oh, he was still an, uh, an unbelievable job. I'll never forget, I reviewed Commanders, and it was my practice on a Tuesday or a Wednesday to phone somebody at the restaurant to fact check, because I was addicted to fact checking. And uh, I called Ella Brennan, <laughs> and I said, I have a few questions for you. She said, why? I said, I'm reviewing the, the the restaurant review is going to appear Friday. She said, "Did you come to the restaurant?" I said, "Yeah." She said, "Who let you in?" <laughs> but uh, no, there's no question that Prudhomme, and and Am as far as Amaral goes, his food was revolutionary. I mean, and Ella told me she had gotten. Uh, an application from him, or somebody had recommended him to her, and so she made it, started making phone calls to restaurants where, to people that knew his work, and she said they all told her he can't cook, but she hired him anyway. <laughs> Were they trying to keep her from stealing him away? I, I guess so. Gene, the, one of the articles you sent me recently was about, mentioned that Al Copeland Launched the first Popeyes. Yes. Oh in no. Arabi. Yeah. In 1972. Yeah. What, what, what does that? I'll tell you. How, I'll tell you. How, I still remember this. I was on the. Uh, I was writing at a. It was right when they brought in what we were calling coal type. And I forget what year that was, but I used to make up the editorial page with. With God, so I was an editorial writer. And the guy who was pasting up the page, I don't know, we started talking about fried chicken. And he said, man, you got to go to this place in Araby called Popeyes if you want good fried chicken. And, and that's, that was that's the what he, of a big change. But that was that it. Tell us, what did the success well, of Popeyes the word was? got out, yeah. apparently, you know, that this guy was doing incredible fried chicken. And everybody started going to Araby to eat fried chicken. Indigenous fried chicken? Yeah, it was sort of local, local, local food. Yeah. Well, it was spicy, you know. But it wasn't. It wasn't Kentucky Fried Chicken. No, I mean he had he had a spice mix that uh, Popeye still owns. Yeah. He sold the spice mix to him when he went bankrupt. But that was that became immensely popular in New Orleans among New Orleans. I'll tell you how popular I was. Matilda Stream used to live a, a block away from me, and I would go to some of her parties. This is the richest woman in Louisiana, and she served, served Popeye's fried chicken at her cocktail parties. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I used to catch the minibus to go to the Vicky and the French Quarter minibus. <laughs> And every now and then you could tell somebody had been to Popeye's because that whole bus <laughs> smelled like Popeye's fried chicken. <laughs> I've boarded airplanes like that before. <laughs> it's, it's a disaster now. It's not any really good at all. No. What else, Justin? Uh, I was just going to ask you, whatever happened to uh, Nathaniel Burton and Henry Carr and the old chefs like that in the 70s? 
seventies and eighties. What happened to those guys? Henry Burton and Nathaniel Burton, who was at Broussards and uh, oh, Caribbean whatever Rose happened Ford. to them? I honestly don't know because yeah. Nathaniel Burton. I didn't even know Nathaniel Burton cooked at Broussards because uh, the owner. Uh, oh God, I know his name is all the the German guy who owned Broussards was so eager, he was an egomaniac, you know, would never admit that somebody else was doing the cooking, so I don't know who cooked the Broussard. Uh, the guy at the Caribbean room uh, was black, which in the Caribbean room in, during the 60s and 70s was the number one sort of luxury restaurant in New Orleans. and. Uh, uh, I know his name as well as I know my own, but I can't think of it right now. And this black guy was producing elegant French-influenced food, the best, in a lot of people, in a lot of people's opinion, in the city. What the hell was his name? I think he's in. I sent you some material in the Caribbean room, and I think he's mentioned in. Yeah, there. I'm sorry, I can't remember. At the yeah, moment. it's not Henry Carr. Not Henry Carr. No. no. When did? When did the, the people who've been creating food in New Orleans start being called chefs? Yeah. And there, we've heard from a, 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 more than one person that we talked to that the, the, the people who made the food were, were called cooks before. And yeah, they got, they and they still paid, are at Antoine's. They got paid on an hourly basis. Yeah. When, when, when did the chef become the chef? It's hard to tell because I guess it sort of gradually emerged, but... Uh, I, I, I don't know. Did Richard Collin focus on the... I don't think it had anything to do with Richard Collin. Uh, like, Ella Brennan had a chef. You know, Paul Blanchet was... Blanchet was the chef at Brennan's originally, uh, at Brennan's Vicare, and then at Brennan's restaurant. Uh, he was the chef. And that was in the late 50s and 60s. No, the, I would say, no, the, the early 50s to early 60s. So chef was, I don't think it was an unknown word. Uh, I would doubt that the word chef was not at all used. I mean, most Cooks who worked in restaurants and who had a kitchen were called cooks. I would agree, but I mean, I'm not talking. Of, we're not talking about the, you know, the really top ones, except for Antoine's. What else? I, I, I'm good. Uh, Gene, this has been great. Yeah. Thanks oh, I enjoyed much. it a lot. Thanks I love much. to pontificate. I think it's terrific. Great. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do it again because there's a lot more to talk about. <laughs> And furthermore, <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you all for including me in this project. I'm honored. It's been a big help. I think it's going to be a great book based on. I I, I can't remember he had right a now. Partner. Pardon? He had a partner, and the, the partner died. The partner may have been a relatives a relative yeah. of the Peronis, but I, they were somehow the yeah. two families were somehow yeah. connected. I know that John Peroni's grandfather bought out the widow of his partner. Oh, really? said that this was the whole point of the John Paul Prudhomme story is what they saw was when Paul Prudhomme really started taking off and restaurants started increasing in the 80s that they saw their restaurant supply side of the business just skyrocket and they were all of a sudden bringing in when you could probably get containers into the port of New Orleans they were bringing in containers of stock you know mixture not like a mixed container not like an entire container of olive oil or cheese or something, but a mixed container and it just didn't make any sense for them to focus in. Being that it's a family business, he's still, like his sons are kind of running. He's semi, not really retired, but his sons are running it. And then he's got grandsons now. He's very excited about this. And uh, one of the few Sicilian families that is, seems to produce enough sons. I don't know why daughters can't run these businesses. But, but at any rate, that, that their future is assured in this business. 
One thing I have to mention to you, have you heard of Montalbano's? Yes. Oh, oh yes. good, because a lot, when I lived in the quarter, a lot of old Thomas there claimed that they Mr. Montalbano created the muffalata, only he called it the Roma sandwich. Greco Roma, Roma Greco sandwich is what, what Sal Logides told me, or Nick Logides told me. And he used to have, Logides, uh, he used Logides. to have a St. Joseph's out there. His yeah. place was in a former stable, a 19th century stable right. Right. that was on St. Philip Street. And, uh, and his son was in prison, and you had to put some money in a jar for his son. Said, the son being in prison. That, that, explains, that explains why the son never went into the business. Now, the ones, the, there was a younger son. Uh, I didn't know about I think that. it was Nick Malcolm, and he ended up working at Napoleon House. Okay. He actually brought the Montalbano olive salad recipe and the muffalata recipe oh. to Napoleon House when they started becoming a cafe in the early 70s. Oh, wow, they that's were, great. I think they're kin of the Impostados, maybe. Okay. Uh, you know, all those families right on St. Right, there, right. There are, a lot of, there are a lot of connections. Well, I am so far away looking to your book. I mean. <laughs> the, the other thing that, uh, that uh, Nick told me is that on the eve of World War II, that Montalbano had a big picture of Mussolini in the restaurant. <laughs> and, the, and that when the war started, it got replaced with a picture of the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, from what I understand, Montalbano sold sandwiches by weight. Right. He is the big, yeah. Right, right. Well. Great. And the other, the other one, Joe Segreto, who 